Now, first thing you're going to note is um, I, I, I'm fascinated by false barriers. You know, I don't know about you. Anybody speaks, it's like the notion you're supposed to come up here and stand, but it's like I'm, I'm mesmerized by things that they tell us we're supposed to do or things we do just rote, and I just always try and find ways to avoid them. So this is a classic example of I, the kind of thinking I really hope we can get our heads around because um, I'm here to talk about systems, a little bit of our journey, our shared interest, our shared business, and this amazing opportunity we have, I, I think, right here, right now. Um, it's wildly appropriate that we're in a business school to talk about this because I'll be honest with you, I don't really um, buy the, the Milton Friedman construct that is so sacrosanct in these schools. You know, Milton Friedman's whole idea of the number one goal of business is to make a bunch of money for its shareholders. I get that. I just don't have any interest in it. But if you think about it, the culture of these business schools, they still, it tends to be a very kind of masculine culture that prizes scale equals size. Size equals big, big equals powerful, powerful equals success. And I want to caution you that, that we need to talk about scale, but I think we need to avoid that, in my opinion, that rubbish. Because I'm interested in scaling. I want to be a very big, powerful organization, but I'm interested in our D idea scaling first. You know, what we do here in LA is designed to be an example of what we collectively are all about. I think a real social entrepreneur doesn't sell their program, they're selling social enterprise, and they're using their program as a living, breathing example. So I just want you to get your head around. We're going to talk about scale because scale is important, but it's not about our own individual things first and foremost. It's like 49.51. 49% of my time will always be LA Kitchen, our team, our mission, but 51% will be how does LA Kitchen play into this larger, more important movement. You get my head? Okay. Um, just so you know, my whole bag is waste is wrong. I hate to see waste. Food and people. Those are the two things that really, and again, we can take a whole lot more, you know, whether it's time, money, love, community, everything. I just hate waste. And so I've constantly been trying to play with formulas that take things that have historically been wasted and reveal its greater power. Now, I had originally wanted to open a nightclub. As was said, I grew up here in Southern California, and we moved to Washington, D.C. when I was a young man. But I went out there convinced of the power of music to get people to open up to ideas they were afraid of. And so for me, opening a nightclub wasn't about selling liquor or making money. It was, again, disguising powerful ideas as entertainment. It's what Jon Stewart and Colbert do every single night with comedy. You know? And it was interesting because I went out one night to serve the poor, and ended up starting a business, a food business, and I discovered suddenly that when I started the DC Central Kitchen, food and music had the same power. The DC Central Kitchen ended up being my nightclub, you know, and the food we used every day became our music. And that's really important because, again, I'm really interested in Trojan horses. You know, a lot of times what we have to talk about in our movement is, is tactics. We're, you can talk all day about things we've, we've all talked about. And we're right, and this is smart, and this is inevitably going to happen. But the thing is, how do we move it along? How do we move it faster? And what you've got is skeptical people, people who don't see this, people who think that's nice if you live in Berkeley and you wear Birkenstocks, but out here it can't really work. And we have to show them it does. So a lot of what I try and do is build these Trojan horses. How do you lure people in? How do you get people over this divide of thinking that won't work to suddenly stopping and saying, wow, can we, does that work? Can, can that work? And if it does, can we do it here too? That interests me. But just so you know, um, I ended up starting the DC Central Kitchen. I told this story a couple of times because I went out one night to feed the poor. And I was so intrigued by this system that I encountered um, that was historic. And it was a group of churches in Washington, DC, who took turns going out each night and they, they bought food at the Safeway in Georgetown, the most expensive store in Washington and most likely the East Coast and quite possibly the solar system. And <laughs> And I was driving around this back in this truck, just going out to do a good deed, right? Just going out to serve the poor. And was intrigued because I thought, wow, I work in an industry, nightclubs, but also a lot of my friends from the business had gone, drifted over to catering. And I knew how much food we all threw away. It was part of, our, uh, of the food ecosystem. Every time you buy a, some food, a certain portion of the price of that food covers loss. And there was this culture in America that's still pervasive, sadly, that it really doesn't matter because food is cheap here, throw it away, there's more where that came from. And so again, I knew that we threw away food. I came to find out 
that in effect we throw away almost 40% of the food we produce every single day in America. But I, I kind of on this idea of, wow, they're buying food when this industry throws away a lot of really good food every night. But what really struck me and what really got me on this journey, and I think will be at the heart of what we're going to talk about today, is when I went to serve people the food we had made with food we had purchased, there was a long line of people standing outside in the rain waiting for this truck to pull up. And as they had night after night, this night happened to be inclement weather, and there they were, all huddled together waiting for this truck to dutifully show up. And as we started ladling food, I became really intrigued and ultimately incensed by this system that had me inside a warm truck serving food to people outside in the rain who had lined up. And what I saw that day is charity in America, which is historic, it's beautiful, it represents part of who we are as a people, but it's developed more, it's more about the redemption of the, of the, the giver, not the liberation of the receiver. And that idea that we could flip that somehow, that there was an opportunity to use food and this was his idea. Imagine if you could, you could, and this kind of came to me on the way back because I was so upset by this notion that these people stood in line every night so a, a different group of people could come out and serve them food. And they were on this endless loop. So I, on the way home, I started ruminating on this idea that was based on FedEx. That in effect, if you could find a central kitchen, you could bring all that food to a central place, and if you processed it, you could potentially feed more people better food for less money. But more importantly, if you could offer men and women a chance to come out of the rain and be part of the solution, you could shorten the line by the very way you served it. And then in effect, return to the restaurants that donated the food, you could go through this cycle and they would get access to men and women who could help them make more money. Everybody would win. It was the perfect code of business, quid pro quo, both sides benefit. Now, this is what has defined my journey ever since. I was rebuffed. I was told by all the different charities, I went door to door selling this idea of efficiency, opportunity, independence, empowerment, the power of food, not just to feed people so they could stay alive for another day to participate in a system, but to liberate people. And not just the people in line, but everybody. Because again, all I was proposing was to take things that existed, not just in DC, but every city in America. And that's a lot of what I do, is try and look for things that exist, not just in one place, but every place, so that this idea, while it might surge in one town because of scale, it can work in any, say, any place because the ingredients exist there too. And the idea was you can take the food that society throws away, the people society undervalues, a kitchen that's underutilized, men and women who want to volunteer, who are looking for a way to be, do something powerful in their community. They're waiting for that, that place to go where they really feel like they did something. People who wanted in out of the rain, chefs who had food but also had skills would help teach but also had jobs, agencies that were buying food when they really wanted to use their limited budgets to liberate people. You know, mayors who wanted to see less homeless people on the street. It was all there. All I did was come in with fresh eyes and try and rearrange the pieces and say, I know this is the historic way we've always approached this. We give our extra money to charity. Charity takes that and goes get the extra food from business, and they serve it to the people we don't value, and that's our system. And I, again, my whole bag has constantly been, I, I get it, I, res, I understand its, its place in our history, but this is America. This is, this is a different, we should, we're better than this. So that's what I wanted to do. But like I said, I was rebuffed. I was told to, in fact, as probably many of you have in your lives, with your ideas, been told that won't work. You know, it's nice, but that, that, that can't possibly go to scale. And for all of us in this room, I'm sure you're here because you powered through that moment. You said, in fact, I, I don't care what you think. I can see it. You know, and I know you can't yet, but I see it, and I'm going to go for it. And that's what I did. You know, when I started the DC Central Kitchen with this idea that if it's done well, again, everybody can benefit, but we can really start to challenge stereotypes about a whole lot of things. You know, obviously, the men and women we serve, like Father Boyle does here, and like so many other groups that you work with, the first idea is how can we help society see men and women that we oftentimes are afraid of, or that we undervalue in a different light, as citizens of a shared city? You know, one of the first things, I go back to that idea of the false barrier. One of the first things I wanted to do was erase the divide of this idea of I'm a volunteer and I'm going to serve somebody a po a, a, across a table, somebody who's poor. Because that divide keeps us apart. And our idea was, you know, let's bring everybody to a, the same side of the table. Because the idea of the kitchen was processing. You know, let's take all these random items and see if we can make something healthier out of, out of it. Again, so we can feed more people better food. 
And the idea was to save as much money as we can for very select agencies so they could do their job better. But fundamentally, I wanted to show people, not just those who happened to come in the kitchen on those rare days, but through the media, whether it was media who came in to visit, as we did yesterday with the LA Times, or whether it was our own media with the birth of the internet and the ability to, to actually have cameras in the kitchen or to take pictures and post it out. But these images of people who would never ever find that place to work side by side suddenly. People who, th who would think, frankly like I did when I was asked to go out and volunteer. I was afraid. I didn't want to go out and serve the homeless. Like everybody, I was burdened by bigotries and stereotypes of who I'd encounter. We all have these fears. So this idea of, of, of a kid doing service, you know, to graduate school, next to someone who might have been in prison for a huge part of their life, you know, and who three years ago might have thought, end it now. You know, I've been in here 20 years, I can't take anymore, and suddenly they're out and they're in a little job training program. You know, it might be, they might be next to a former addict who had burned every bridge, you know, had every relative locked the door when they saw him coming, you know, and now suddenly they're in this job training program. And it might be the President of the United States. You know? And on many occasions, we had presidents and first families come. And this powerful notion that we could show how in this rare spot, the president is just like the average citizen. When they come into a kitchen and you're going to say, we're going to cook for 5,000 people, they don't know what to do. And this magic moment when somebody who was in prison three years ago, again, wondering how they were going to possibly live any longer, suddenly in this magic moment, they're saying, no, sir, you do it this way. You know, and the power of media to show, to show the American public that as smart as, as Barack Obama is, as smart as Bill Clinton is, as smart as all those people are, in this, in, in this situation, right here, right now, that person knows more than they do. That person can teach them how to take care. And this idea that next to each other, side by side, we could serve our city. That, that in fact, the only way to solve hunger in D.C. or any city is this idea that we have to work side by side. Charity alone can't do it. Farmers alone can't do it. Business alone can't do it. It is a group effort. That's kind of what we set out to do. Now, it's interesting because about 60 cities did something like this. And again, the idea was you can do it in any city. Now, this isn't the story of Robert Egger in the DC Central Kitchen. This is the story of existing assets in every community. What I'm trying to show here is how on my journey, what I've tried to do is pivot from existing resources every which way, building up slowly to make the same point we're all here to drive home, that there's a powerful economic opportunity in America, in every single city, and it's tied up in the food system. You know, and how do we reveal that? That's what interests me. So the first generation of kitchens, man, we were roaring along, training men and women for work, launching our own social enterprise businesses. You know, we went through a long phase of, like most charities, sitting here and waiting for the phone to ring and have restaurants, hotels, hospitals, farmers call up and say, I've got food that I can't sell. Would you come pick it up? I've got food that's so rotten no one will take it. Will you come take it? That's charity in America. And I work with the CEO and I urge you to reach out to him. And if you, if you want to go and visit the DC Central Kitchen, Mike Curtin, the current CEO, came in and basically I, I brought in to kind of take me out of the day to day. He came up with this really amazing idea, which is why are we waiting for food to be so spent that it's donated when we can go out and buy it now? And that, that, that small notion that you could go out to farmers in rural Virginia and Pennsylvania and Maryland and offer them 10, 15, 20 cents on the dollar for food that they couldn't sell, that they were dissed under. And you heard this constantly a theme throughout our morning. How much food is dissed under? Of the 40% of food we throw away every day, half of that's fruits and vegetables. Half of all the food we throw away. And it's primarily wasted because it's cosmetically imperfect, it's geometrically irregular, it's overripe, it's underripe, or it's just too expensive to bring to market. What a bonanza. And that opened an amazing door because once as a charity you buy food, you have the potential to start a social enterprise and then sell it. And that opened the door to a place where we actually took a rudimentary uh, catering company to a whole new level where it generates now almost 60% of the earned income for the DC Central Kitchen through contracts primarily doing locally sourced, cook from scratch meals for DC public schools. And again, men and women who were felons doing the cooking, not serving. As you can imagine, there's barriers to who can be in a school. But you get my point, that we could actually create a healthier meal for less money and pay the wages to our employees. We could pay $13 an hour with full benefits because we reduce the cost of the product by sourcing locally. It's a canard that people think that it's too expensive to buy local. Actually, it's more expensive to have the Cisco truck pull up than it is to go out and source. 
You know, what we did is we basically, by sourcing the seconds, we lowered the cost and we reinvested in people. You know, and so what you had is a workforce that dug their job. These people trained me. They gave me a job when no one else would because I got a felony conviction. They paid me $13 an hour with benefits. And they put me in a place where I'm doing a great job. I'm helping to rebuild the city I tore up when I was young. Kids are eating a healthy meal because of me today. You know, and I really want to stop for a second because a big lesson was learned in this. This is really important in our business because sometimes in this business we can tend to be a little bit of, of nutritional imperialists. You know, we want to come in and tell other people how to eat. You know, and one of the first lessons we learned is the smartest way to get kids to eat healthy is what do they like and make that healthier first. You know, whatever they like to eat, figure that out and make that healthy and invite them into the process. Ask them all, all the way along the line, do you like this, do you like this, do you like this? And then, and only then, can you start to integrate stuff in. So that was a powerful thing, but the first generation of kitchens started to really grow, and we, they all wanted to build brand new kitchens. And it's like, I get it, I get it, I get it, but there's got to be a more effective way to grow this idea than everyone building a brand new kitchen. And that's when, on a visit to rural Indiana, and I think a fellow Hoosier um, in Cordon, Indiana, the first state capital, I was sitting at a stoplight because my parents retired there, and I'm looking and looking and looking, and all of a sudden it was one of those eureka moments. There was a high school, a brand new high school sitting there with a cafeteria that was going to be closed all afternoon, all night, and all weekend. And as I looked at it, I realized every single kid in that school has to do service. A little sidebar, in America, we've raised the millennials, the biggest, most diverse, most educated generation, 100 million strong, doing service. Every single university, this entire university, I guarantee you probably 99% of the freshman class has done service. And probably 20% of them have the bug, the itch. They want it, they, they, they got something they like, so they're out there. That's that big army. But the point is, the old model still said, false barrier, you gotta leave school and get on a bus and we'll drive down to Louisville, Kentucky. We'll drive down to the inner city and you can feed the poor. Just, just constantly drumming in false, negative, stupid stereotypes about where hunger and poverty exist, instead of looking in your own backyard. I saw that there was a big, a, a big field that could be not just a garden, but I also knew that town was full of older people. And one of the economic realities in America right now, and this is big league ball in every city in America, this older generation, 80 million strong, the baby boomers, they must stay at home and live independently as long as possible and stay productive as long as possible. So volunteerism is key. So dragging those old men and women up that hill and doing intergenerational after school programs was key. So whether it's an intergenerational garden whether it's an after-school program, you see where I'm going. Imagine the power of an after-school program in the cafeteria. Cafeterias should be viewed as one of the great learning labs in America, yet we see them as little gas stations. Herd them in. Even though we're talking about better food in school, we still only see it as a gas station, as opposed to a place where people like me, who are the majority of Americans, I believe, who can't learn math and science out of a book. We're manipulative learners. But if you, give me fraction, I mean, if you give me measuring cups, I can learn fractions. I can grasp science. Imagine a, a cafeteria being used to do an after-school cooking club, remedial math, science, nutrition, social enterprise. Imagine older people coming up and mentoring younger people after school, each getting a snack so they physically can learn. So that old person goes down the hill saying, I had a great time. That kid I'm mentoring was really into it. And they were into it because they got a snack. You know what I mean? And that idea of, I'm going to come back, both sides get something. The idea of intergenerational garden growing food that's served to the kids at the after-school snack. But more importantly, imagine replacing the antiquated pantry system in which we serve the working poor in America. And if you had to pick a face of who's hungry in America, you know who it is? It's a single mom with one job or probably two. And the reality is she doesn't have time to go to the pantry and then go home and root through a box of odds and ends, oftentimes with very, very minimal nutritional content. You know, so the idea of, of meals to go for a working mom made by kids in an after-school program. Well, that became campus kitchens, and there's now 41, one of those, 41 of those around America. Again, there's 60,000 school cafeterias. So you see where I'm going now. Again, surplus, surplus food, rural surplus urban demand, school contracts. You know, as Claire Fox, our good friend, said earlier, I saw you looking when I said your name, um, as Claire pointed out, the Good Food Purchasing Act, you know, that's urban demand matched with rural surplus. You see what I'm getting at? There's an equation here. You know, look at if you were, now I'm opening up LA Kitchen. If I was smart, I would have considered potentially opening up a kitchen out in Fresno and processing out there 
and shipping it downtown you know, to an urban market that wants this product. You know what's fascinating about the, urban, the, the Good Food Purchasing Act and the real opportunity for us? You all probably know this, that U.S. Foods and Cisco just merged. And now that accounts for about 60% of our food, right? So in most restaurants, including UCLA, for the most part, those big trucks pull up. Now they want local, but U.S. Foods and Cisco isn't designed to serve local. So the idea of creating that system that says, in effect, there is a growing demand for this product at UCLA, within, within um, cities themselves. Now, I came out here primarily for three things. A, you know, as I said, um, the food that I relied on, the food I made my bones on, food that came from restaurants, hotels, the food that fills our pantries, that's lost profit. It's going away every single day, every single day. It's one of the reasons I'm so honored to partner with Rick Namias, where's Rick? There he is, and the folks at Food Forward, because Rick was one of the leaders here who understood there was a huge opportunity in stuff that was falling off the trees all throughout the backyards. But fruits and vegetables is the long-term sustainable product we can count on within this system to feed poor people in America. So I'm very interested in that, right? But that takes processing. That's what's really extending this idea of how can you extend the shelf life, you know, so that you chop, dice, and hear, it, hear me now, brothers and sisters, pureeing, is the future. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> talk about that later. But again, chop, dice, puree, freeze, refrigerate, cook immediately. So you got the food, but you also had the need. LA is the home to the largest concentration of older people living in poverty in America. 1.2 million over 65 right now in LA, and that number is going to double in the next 10 years. Now hear me on this. Right now, less than 10% of eligible seniors in America use SNAP benefits, go to a farmer's market, or rely on Meals on Wheels. They're the prideful generation. You know, they're not, they don't take charity. Right around the bend, clear as day you can see them. And by the way, I'm somewhat of an amateur futurist. What's probability? How can you see opportunity right around the corner and, and adapt early? What I see coming, most people would see as a bad thing. And that's an army of older people, the baby boomers, who've been raised to consume. You know, they were raised to buy everything they could get their mitts on. What you own is, your, is who you are. You know, and what, what's going to happen is you've got, uh, right now, of all workers in America, all workers between 45 and 60, half do not have $10,000 set aside, aside for retirement. Half. 30% of seniors in California now rely exclusively on Social Security. So what's coming around the bend is going to be an army of people who are going to live 10 years longer than they got money in the bank. That's a really big deal. But it's also, for us, an amazing opportunity. As I suggested earlier, many of us roared into school food saying this is a chance to expose an economy of scale around local food. If we can start to show that local food can have a tremendous role in not just feeding kids better meals, but supporting a local economy too, that's powerful. And again, as, as you know, I've done a lot of work in that field. I'm pivoting now to say the best way we can amplify that is to start to look at the seniors coming. Because in school food, for those of you who do it, the reimbursement rate for school food is $2.80 per meal. And we were able to do that in D.C. again, locally sourced, cooked from scratch, 13 an hour with full benefits and enough profit to reinvest it over in the, in the, in the services of the nonprofit. Senior meals, the reimbursement rate is $3.60. Almost a full dollar more per meal available for the exact same nutritional content. Imagine the opportunity now if we can start to say to a generation 80 million strong, who again, 10, only 10% use the system now. And what's generations coming will amp up need. You'll see a huge up in demand for charitable food. This is, can be an amazing driver for us because if we can start businesses that say to the city, I want that contract and here's what I'll do for you. I'll create a system in which I'll support local farmers. Our goal in the LA Kitchen is to purchase between five and seven million dollars directly from farmers in the Central Valley and Ventura in our first five years, right? And we want to use that to have a system in which graduates of our job training program, and our training program this time will take young men and women who are aging out of foster care. And you know, one of the people I look to very closely when I talk about this is Eric from Tender Greens, who's on our board, who served our meals today and deserves a big round of applause for his leadership and the meal he provided. But many of you all might not know that Eric already has done tremendous work for many, many years employing young men and women aging out of foster care at Tender Greens. But that idea of this generation who is statistically on the way to prison, that's one group we want to train, but we also want to train older men and women coming home. 
the idea of intergenerational. I'm very fixated on this idea that the only way this farm system works is if we start to re-explore the agriculture. Not just agriculture, the agriculture. That was a time in America, and I don't want to romanticize it too much, but it was that idea where everybody had a role and everybody had a job, and you learn from each other. So that idea of can older men and women home from prison and younger men and women learn with and from each other? Can older men and women, in effect, stand in front of the statistical door that says that young man and woman from foster care is going to go to prison and say, I'm not going to let you make the same mistake I did? There is no way. You know, can younger men and women help older reacclimate? But can they learn with each other, help thousands of volunteers? Our goal, and as you all will see, and those of you all who came yesterday for a tour, part of our system is a room about half this big that will just be a giant sea of stainless steel tables where older volunteers, Younger volunteers managed by men and women in the job training program will work all day long chopping and dicing, rocking and rolling every single day. Helping people, again, get the food we need. Upstairs is where employees will work to do the senior meals contract. But again, same to the city. We can take men and women who would cost 45 grand per year if they went back to prison. And now they're earning. And our goal, again, is to create about $32 million in salaries in the first five years between graduates who work for us or who go out and get jobs through our job, uh, our job training program and graduate. We will produce a healthier meal, a more ethnically diverse meal for you. Because the, it's not just getting the contract. America is going to reach a big critical point here around food in which we have to figure out not just a way to feed these men and women local food, but to use local food to reveal a power to reduce that meal price significantly so that America can afford to feed all the older people who are poor, but pay, feed them in a way that actually makes them healthier, stronger, and pulls them out. You know, again, I just don't want to feed people charity. My bag has always been, how can you use meals to really pull people back in? The goal of all this is to reveal bigger, heavier truths. How do we value our elders in America? You know, how do we see the things that we throw away, whether it's food or people, as equally important to a new American economy? That's what I'm after, but that's what we do together. That's our shared mission. You know, what we're all here to talk about is this new, food system. And what we need to do is get people excited about it more than anybody else. We need elected officials to get excited about this. Tomorrow I'm doing a speech for men and women who run municipal governments, for, uh, the Southern California Municipal Government Society. And that fascinates me because again, you can talk to me, I want the city administrators. They're the invisible hands. They're the ones who have to figure out how do you make the city run. How do we feed this army of older Americans a, a, a better, healthier meal? You know, they're the ones that we should be talking to. So what we've been trying to do, and I think what we all have to be part of, is saying, look, there's a variety of these economies of scales that are out there. One might be school food. One might be this idea of farmer's markets. One might be the idea of emer the emerging small food manufacturers. Another might be senior meals on wheels. All of us independently are pretty darn cool. But collectively, that's where the action's at. That's what we have to be part of. That idea that all of us have a, you know, a destiny, a role to play. But it's really only when we stand together, I think, can we really reveal the true power of food and, and really challenge um, elected leaders to look at what we do, not just as a toss-off, not just as a good potential idea, not just as a little niche, but something really powerful. Again, think about this. You know, our goal, what we want to see eventually and what we should all be working towards is a day when mayors wake up um, and, they, and when, when mayors show up on day one and say, you don't have to tell me about social enterprise. You don't have to tell me about local food. You don't have to tell me about this because I get it, and I want to do it right now. You know, and it's not just LA, man. It's Fresno. It's Bakersfield. It's Stockton. It's that string of bankrupt cities right up the Central Valley because you can do the same thing there. You know, we are, all of us, crusaders on a powerful pilgrimage. You know, and what we're selling, what we're, what we're discovering, and what our responsibility is, is to help America see that there is a powerful new formula that goes beyond Milton Friedman, you know, that says, in effect, in the future, it's how do we keep every penny local? You know, how do we keep every penny in the local economy surging, roaring? But how do we keep people healthy? How do we people, keep people engaged? Um, how do we reveal the true power of food to be there as part of that new equation? Thank you all very, very much. I think I allowed...